Thanks everyone for coming this morning. Uh, I have to say right at the start, I'm both very excited and also a little bit nervous uh, to talk to you today about the application of economics, especially Austrian economics, to the study of games, video games, and in particular, virtual worlds. Uh, and both excited and a little what worried be, uh, for the same reason, which is that this is a very new area in economics. Uh, if you know anything about the history of economic thought, you know that the key questions have really been debated for centuries and centuries. And there's usually very little that's, that's new under the sun in, in economics. Usually in one way or another, somebody's been talking about it for a very long time. But particularly when we get onto things like the study of virtual worlds, this is a genuinely new area of economics. Um, it's really only been around for about 25 years or so because it was only in the late 90s and early 2000s that the kind of games, the kind of virtual worlds that we'll be talking about were, were actually technologically feasible. And since then, they've grown by leaps and bounds and you know, as has the, the sort of the, the broader industry. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's you know, getting into sort of new territory. And unlike so many of these other topics, you know, like money and uh, price theory and so on, we don't have centuries and centuries uh, of, of insights from great economists to sort of guide us. Um, so in a way, you know, it's, a little, uh, uh, it's a little harrowing to kind of strike out on your own um, and talk about something like this that's, uh, that's genuinely new. Um, nevertheless, uh, my hope in this talk is to uh, convince you, if maybe you're a little bit skeptical, that this is an area that Austrian economists should be interested in, and it's an area with a lot of potential for sort of research and writing and so on. So um, you now, again, if you're skeptical uh, about this, uh, I hope to convince you if you think, you know, if you maybe think you're a little sort of too cool uh, for, uh, for games, uh, hopefully I will be able to, to change your mind by the end of this. I mean, at the same time, who am I talking to? This is a Mises event. None of you are too cool for anything, but you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, nevertheless, I hope, uh, I hope to show you that this is uh, an exciting and, you know, dare I say, fun area in which to apply some of the ideas that you've been learning about so far this week. So, uh, even though this is a small and, rel and it, I mean, it's growing quickly, but it's a relatively new area, it is, um, there's still way too much to be able to, to just to cover everything uh, you know, in a systematic way in such a short lecture. So what I'm going to do instead is give you an overview of a lot of different topics, just to kind of give you a flavor of the different types of research that go on in this area and the, the, the kind of potential for, for, uh, for, for more work on this in the future. Uh, now, by the way, I will say, again, there's obviously an element in a lot of this to, uh, you know, the, there's an element of, uh, you know, how do you do, fellow kids, you know, like I'm the, you know, older guy, you know, trying to talk to the, the youths of today about uh, something that they, they might be interested in. Um, so I'll absolutely, you know, plead guilty to that. Uh, and in fact, I was, yesterday I was kicking myself because what I should have called this was something like retro video games in Austrian economics or something like that to try and market this as a, a look back at the classics and things. Because otherwise, this is, uh, you know, some of these examples, I'm going to be dating myself uh, as far as uh, um, some, of the, some of the examples that I have for you. But in any case, whatever, you can't please everybody. Um, all right. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today is covered in one way or another in uh, different chapters of a book that I edited a couple of years ago called The Invisible Hand in Virtual Worlds. And um, basically, in this book, I and a number of other economists uh, looked at different types of games, different aspects of games in the gaming industry um, with a view to, to sort of you know, seeing what economics has to say about them. Um, so I will mention a couple of these in greater detail as we go along. But if there's anything in, in here that you find particularly sort of interesting or you want to know more, uh, please just let me know. Um, I'd be happy to send you uh, copies of uh, um, the, uh, uh, you know, send you some, shoot me an email and I'll send you some PDFs and things like that of different chapters or anything like that in the book uh, that might happen to, uh, to interest you. Um, because I, miss, I mean, I'm assuming most of you are not independently wealthy and this, the, the book is extremely expensive. So you really don't want to have to shell out the $120 or whatever it is the, uh, to, uh, to pay for this. Uh, but get in touch and I'll be happy to, uh, to let you know more about any of this. Okay, so first of all, what do we mean when we talk about video game 
economics? What kinds of research are we going to discuss? And there are a few different types um, that we could think about here. The first one is a more kind of fundamental sort of research um, that has to do with some uh, philosophical or methodological questions about where games and, and where play activities fit in economics, uh, where they fit in social science more broadly. Because as I'll mention in a moment, there are some sort of controversies about this and about whether or not it's even possible to use economics to talk about the action of play and about the experience of games in general and then also video games in particular. So there's some fundamental questions there. Also involved in that uh, are questions about um, uh, sort of um, in interpretation um, and what we might basically literary criticism and using economics to analyze video games and sort of draw lessons out of them. Um, there's uh, I don't know if uh, any of you are, uh, were familiar with uh, Paul Cantor, who was a um, uh, sort of uh, Austrian literary critic. He was a professor of literature at the University of Virginia for, for many decades. He passed away a few years ago. And uh, Paul Cantor was a, was a pioneer of applying Austrian economics, as well as sort of liberal libertarian principles um, to literary criticism. And if you know anything about this particular area of academia, you know that um, ideologically, economically, uh, it's, uh, it's just an absolute mess. Uh, and I just wanted to say a quick word of, of tribute to, to Paul Cantor, because he really pioneered this. And in his later years, one of the things that he was talking about a lot was how video games were going to be sort of the next frontier of this research agenda. So I just wanted to point to that uh, just in passing and say that um, if you are, for example, a scholar, if you're working in the humanities or something like that, this is one of those fields that it's just it's wide open um, for uh, for people to come in and put uh, put a an, an Austrian interpretation uh, on the uh, on the analysis of, of games. Um, then. Scaling up somewhat, uh, we have the topic of virtual worlds. And this is where the vast majority of economic research is done today. As I said, um, when it comes to sort of um, the, the fundamental analysis of games and play, that's mostly done in humanities and communications, media studies, and so on. But to the extent that economists are studying games, usually what they're studying are virtual worlds. And I'll explain exactly what those, that, that means as, as we go along. But uh, to make a long story short, virtual worlds have been growing enormously in terms of their size, in terms of their complexity, and in terms of the amount uh, and, uh, again, the complexity of economic activity that occurs inside them. So the development of in-game virtual currencies, um, the development of in-game assets that have you know, real world tradable economic value and so on. Um, there's lots and lots going on in there. And there's just some, some very interesting sort of case studies that you can draw from this as well. And then finally, you have the economics of the video game industry as a whole. And again, if you've followed anything about gaming in the past, well, basically as long as gaming has existed, you know that the industry is, is very paradoxical. Uh, on the one hand, it's grown tremendously over the past 50 years. It's, it's absolutely enormous at this point. At the same time, it's the center of one controversy after another. And most of the controversies have something to do with the economic state of the industry. Uh, and uh, I will talk about all of these things um, once we, uh, you know, uh, over the course of the, the presentation. Uh, and for now, I'll just point out that to some extent, a lot of these fields, they do overlap. Um, they're not neatly divided, uh, as I've suggested here. They do overlap. They do mutually influence each other. And just as an example of this, which I will come to in more detail later, when, if you look at the, the way that the current state of the game industry affects the actual creation of games and the actual experience that players go through, there are lots of examples of this. You know, recently, for instance, there's a big controversy about the use of uh, generative AI in creating assets in games because that allegedly steals jobs from hardworking animators and things like that. Um, that's driven by economic factors. That's driven by you know, the increasing costs of developing AAA gaming titles, uh, which makes it much cheaper to substitute generative AI for you know, living, breathing animators and things like that. Uh, and you could say the same thing about all kinds of other controversies as well, um, microtransactions, loot boxes, things of this nature. These are sort of economics cost-driven uh, controversies that come up. And so if you want to understand 
you know, how these things have played out. You really need economics as a, as a framework uh, in order to do that. OK. So just to say something quickly about what it, mean, uh, what it means to uh, when we talk about games, because we're going to start sort of broadly with some of the, 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 the big questions, the deeper questions about what games are and how they fit within economics. And here we have Frank Knight uh, in his intriguingly titled essay, The Sickness of Liberal Society, where he's talking about what it means, what a, what a game is, and especially what play activity is. This is a whole area of research in humanities and in the social sciences. And as I say, there's controversy about where economics fits into this. But here, Knight is making a pretty sort of standard point um, about why games are separate or why, how they're sometimes different from our ordinary activity. And what he's suggesting is that games are actions like any other. Um, like all actions, they have an end in mind. Um, but Knight points out that when you talk about a game, you're talking about an end that is in some sense symbolic or maybe artificial. Um, it's specially constructed for the purpose of engaging in this activity. Right? So this is one difference uh, in engaging in sort of play than uh, regular, uh, sort of regular ac action or maybe our action in the marketplace. Uh, and on the other hand, Knight says, um, the value of play lies as much in the activity of pursuit as in the enjoyment of the result. Right? So to some extent, um, yes, you have an end, but sort of the means and the ends are not always clearly separated. Sometimes um, another way of putting this is that play is about process. It's not necessarily about a clear, definable end state like winning. A lot of times it's the process that you go through uh, that gives the enjoyment rather than a sort of a clearly defined goal that you're working towards in time. Right. Um, so again. You know, sometimes you know, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the journey is more important than the destination. It's the play itself rather than, say, maybe winning or something like that um, that we get our, our real value from, right? Or at least that's what losers say about these kinds of things. So uh, again, I bring this up uh, to highlight the fact that there is a whole academic discipline devoted to the study of games. And these days, it's devoted largely to the study of video games because they've become so financially and so culturally significant. And that area is called ludology. Um, it was founded by this fellow at the bottom, uh, Johan Huizinga, who was a Dutch historian who published a very influential book called Homo Ludens, which was an attempt to study the role of games and play in culture. And Huizinga essentially created this academic discipline of ludology where people study games and play and all of the cultural and social factors that, that surround them and influence them. Right? And as I say, today, this is mainly devoted to the, to the study of video games because they're so important. And uh, but one thing that Huizinga and others have sort of emphasized is this distinction between play and uh, and work, right? So the idea is that there's supposed to be a strong distinction between the, essentially the economic side of life or the economic side of action and uh, the world of play, the world of leisure, and so on. And uh, for one of the, the really important points that Huizinga made is that. Um, it's play that is the kind of vital formative element in, in creating human culture and human society, right? Um, so he's a, he's a very sort of interesting thinker. I'm not going to dwell too much on, on his ideas, but I just want to point out that he played this fundamental role, um, and especially in helping set up this distinction between what's supposed to go on in our economic lives and what's supposed to go on in our leisure time, in our play lives, and so on. Right. Uh, by, by the way, Huizinga does have a, a sort of uh, an Austrian connection because in the 1920s he was uh, he toured the United States uh, with a number of uh, of European academics, uh, one of whom it turns out uh, was Mises. So yeah, so Mises was there at the beginning. He was the OG uh, OG gamer. Uh, <laughs> OK, so again, just a, just a quick word, because as I say, there's a controversy. And a lot of people say, look, you can't even really apply economics to games, or you shouldn't. That's, uh, that's what's called economic imperialism, um, trying, you know, uh, economists not staying in their lane and doing what they do. Um, so this uh, aggravates humanities scholars to no end when they try to do this. 
But a lot of this is based on a kind of erroneous distinction that I mentioned already between uh, our economic lives and our non-serious leisure play lives, right? And I just want to point out briefly that from a sort of a Misesian perspective, this distinction really doesn't exist. And in fact, people like uh, Huizinga and Knight and Mises all emphasized at different points that we do not have this clear separation of our lives um, between these different elements, right? We are not the economic man when we go to work and mindlessly sort of maximize monetary profit, and then we you know, punch the clock, get off work, um, and become playing man, right? Um, rather, throughout our lives, and most of our actions have a, are a, like a complex uh, uh, combination of play and work, right? Or leisure and labor, right? Um, we have very complex values and preferences and value scales. And as I said, all of these people that I've been talking about have recognized that pretty clearly. So a lot of the complaints that people will make about using economics in these areas are not very well grounded, I would say. Okay. Um, and here is sort of Mises um, making this point very well and talking about the, the variety of ways in which games come into our action. And in particular, he makes this very important point that games, they can be an end, uh, but they can also be a means, right? And in a way, he's setting up at least two different sort of strands of research that Austrians can investigate here. Uh, because on the one hand, he says, you know, for, for many people get, engaging in games, this is an end, right? Um, we like you know, the thrill of the challenge. We like you know, overcoming obstacles and so on. Um, we like thinking, you know, as he says, you know, people whose vanity is flattered by the display of their skill and superiority. If you ever played a competitive game, you, I'm sure you know what this is all about. Um, so on the one hand, yes, games are often an end, but at the same time, they are often a means as well. And this is a very much more conventional economic uh, way of approaching games. Um, because in the context of, of video games, um, as soon as you have the professionalization of gaming, as soon as people make money from it, then gaming becomes a means rather than an ends for the most part uh, for these people. So if you think about uh, esports, uh, streaming, um, and all of these other um, little sort of niche industries that have grown up around gaming that involve professionalizing it and turning it into a commercial pursuit, um, this is exactly the kind of thing that, uh, that Mises is, is talking about here. Okay. So. Let's actually start talking a little more uh, specifically about uh, games. And I want to begin um, with talking about uh, that uh, interpretive approach that I mentioned before, um, talking about um, how the foundations of games, of modern video games, reflect economic problems, uh, the way that games are structured by giving gamers economic problems to solve and the way that the fundamental principles of economics give meaning to the play experience um, that, that you have as a gamer, right? So uh, as always, uh, economics, as with gaming, it always starts with scarcity, right? Um, you can see these kind of principles play out really clearly through different genre conventions. And uh, again, just as in sort of the real world, uh, gaming is structured by fundamental problems of scarcity. It's kind of hard to imagine what a game would be like without some element of scarcity, right? You see this, it really comes to the forefront if you look at things like strategy games, survival horror games, you know, there's a there's got to be a trillion different games that are set during some kind of zombie apocalypse or something like that. And the reason is that this brings the scarcity element to the forefront, right? Society collapses. We have no way to survive. We have no way to satisfy our basic needs. So what do we do, right? So these kind of gameplay loops are fundamentally about scarcity. You never quite have enough. And that's what drives the entire play experience. A few months back, I was playing the remake of Resident Evil 2, and I was really amazed by how well they did this, but just how, like, how, how cleverly crafted it was in terms of just barely giving you enough to survive and sort of move on a little bit. Um, and then just as you think you're sort of getting the hang of it and you know, you stockpiled a few resources and you're starting to feel pretty good about yourself, they, uh, they hit you with something completely new and then you're back to square one again. Right? So it's all about scarcity. It's all about how to figuring out how to use 
uh, your, your highly scarce resources. Um, and this is one reason, I think, why these kind of genres, you know, or like these settings, like, you know, the, the post-apocalyptic world and so on, why I think they're so popular um, is because they really bring a lot of these economic elements uh, just uh, right to the forefront. And if you think about it, if you ever got rid of scarcity, you would basically get rid of what it means to be playing a game, in a sense, right? You know, if you if you sort of you know if you nerf a game and you just give players infinite resources, uh, there's no challenge anymore, right? The gameplay experience kind of disappears, right? Um, and at that point, either the game disappears, or maybe you have to reinvent it by coming up with a new kind of scarcity. A good example of that I was thinking about the other day was uh, speed running, right? So if you look at like professional speed runners. There's no challenge for them at all in the games themselves that they play. That's long gone. But what they've done is reinvent them by inventing a new kind of scarcity and plugging it into the game. In this case, the scarcity of time. And so you spend hundreds and thousands of hours practicing just to save a fifth of a second off a world record or something like that. Um, but it just goes to show how necessary uh, the, um, the, the, the scarcity element is to create these kind of compelling experiences. Uh, same thing goes for choice and trade-offs. So again, games like real life, in a sense, are just a long series of choices that you have to make as a player. Just like real life, sometimes those choices are made without much deliberation or without much judgment. Sometimes you really have to agonize over them, right? And depending which is which usually depends on the size of the benefits, the size of the costs that you have in front of you. And you see this particularly if you look at classic adventure games or if you look at more recent, very narrative-focused games that are explicitly about making tough choices, you see this come through again, I think, really, really well. And especially in the last couple of decades, there's just been such a growth in terms of high-quality writing, um, high-quality sort of narrative structure in games that it's now possible to give people really compelling experiences based on based purely on making choices that people really have to sort of agonize over, right? So have you ever played, for instance, any games that uh, Telltale Games made? Uh, for instance, again, Zombie Apocalypse, they had a Walking Dead series, uh, which is really tremendous in terms of getting players to balance scarcity and make really difficult choices about, you know, sort of who lives, who dies, who do you help, who do you, you know, who do you throw to the, the zombies so you can escape yourself, this kind of stuff. The, as narrative quality has uh, has in, increased, so too has the sort of economic difficulty of making choices and, and so on. So again, it's another, I think, uh, useful example of this. Uh, whoop. Likewise, opportunity costs. Here is a case where I think this notion is intuitive, even if you've never heard of the concept of opportunity cost or has never studied economics. If you've ever played an RPG, I think you understand this principle very, very well. Because opportunity cost tells us that the true cost of something is not the money that you spend on it, it's what you give up in order to, uh, in order to get it. Right? So if you look at an RPG and if you ever sat you know, in front of your screen for 10 minutes agonizing over how you were going to develop your skill tree, uh, which skill to choose, which to give up, um, or you know, which class or which race to choose or what have you, then you know about this problem already. Because it's very easy to see that when you're spending experience points in order to gain a skill, the cost, the thing that's really tough to do, is not spending the points. Those are irrelevant you realize that what you're, the, the real cost is what you're giving up. And what you're giving up is the alternate play experience that you would have had if you'd chosen a different skill or a different specialization or something like that. Right? So again, I think there's a lot of intuitive economic logic that's just built into these aspects of games. Then as we scale up a little bit, especially once you get into MMOs and virtual worlds and so on, you see this even more. You see the emergence of complex social relations, division of labor, specialization, and whatnot. Particularly in massively multiplayer online games, they tend to be constructed around the impossibility of doing things on your own. Right? Um, what Mises would call uh, economic autarky uh, is basically impossible in an MMO. You need a group of people, sometimes a substantial group of people, in order to progress, in order to complete you know, the, the main parts of the gameplay loop. And at, at the same time, crucially, not everybody can be doing the same thing when you're, in, when you're playing in a team or in a guild or what have you. 
people need to specialize. You need to diversify your skills because, again, this is a central part of the way games are constructed, right? So you can't, and not everybody can be, you know, a warrior, right? Somebody's got to be a tank and somebody has to do crowd control and somebody has to suck it up and decide that they're going to be the healer, right? Which nobody wants to be uh, and so on. But you need specialization among roles or classes or however this is, you know, sort of determined um, in, uh, in a particular game. And just as this has happened, we've seen uh, in a very kind of Hayekian way the spontaneous emergence of all kinds of economic relationships. Right? It's not just the social side of things, but economically too, the way people uh, sort of spontaneously figure out the most effective ways to trade with each other in games um, and the most effective ways to govern their economic activities. And I'm going to talk more about that uh, in a minute as well. Uh, and then lastly, entrepreneurship, which uh, occurs in many different ways in games, some of them sort of symbolic and others very literal. So on the more literal side, um, in a lot of sim games or sort of uh, open world MMO type games, uh, Second Life and Entropia and those kinds of things, they were the, the path breakers. You see the emergence of very of literal markets, right? As people start to develop digital properties, you buy digital land in the virtual world, you buy it with real world money or with money that can be exchanged for real world currency at a certain exchange rate and so on. Um, all of this, of course, uh, coming back to my talk on, uh, on Monday, involves using your property, using your scarce property in the face of uncertainty um, and, you know, and risking uh, serious uh, financial losses um, in order uh, to make a profit in a virtual world, right? Uh, but although the world is might be virtual, uh, the financial side of it uh, is very, very real, uh, as we will see. Okay, so moving on to virtual worlds specifically, and I've got dark universe Mises here. Um, if I'm confident of one thing, it's that if Mises were alive today, he would have hated video games. Um, me, if, you, if you know anything about me, Mises hated detective stories. He thought they were like the lowest form of popular culture. Um, and uh, if you can, if you can, if you thought that about video games, I mean, you can imagine what he would have thought about, you know, Grand Theft Auto or something like that. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about virtual worlds now and some of the lessons that we can learn from them. So very quickly, virtual worlds are persistent digital spaces in which players interact with each other through avatars in real time. Right? Um, the most important part of that is that they are persistent. So they exist, they run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even whether or not anybody's actually inhabiting them or acting in them at the moment. Right? So they're always there. So they provide a pretty, you know, a potentially enormous uh, sort of forum for people to engage in economic and social behavior with each other. And as a result of that, they ha offer some unique opportunities for economists who are, are who want to study them. Right. Overall, what we're mainly interested in when economists look at virtual worlds is looking at different problems of social order or maybe social chaos when things go wrong. I'll have examples of both of those. Um, but more narrowly, um, one of the great benefits of looking at virtual worlds is that they're just, they provide another new opportunity to demonstrate the universality of the principles of economics. Because one thing that we've learned over the past 25 years or so is that the more virtual worlds develop, the larger they get, the more players they have, and the more complex uh, the, the play in them becomes, the more we begin to see the same principles of economics emerge as we have in the real world for the past you know, thousands and thousands of years. And so it's, it provides a, a sort of a terrific opportunity to look at these problems in a fresh way and with fresh examples, um, as opposed to you know, the, the, the same sort of historical records that we've been uh, looking at for, uh, for, for centuries and centuries. Um, so on the one hand, it's a great opportunity just in the sense to sort of teach economics. At the same time, uh, virtual worlds also have um, an important function as a kind of natural experiment. So economists or who do sort of empirical research are always trying to on the lookout for good natural experiments. And virtual worlds offer these because typically when you have, say, like an MMO, like World of Warcraft or something like this, this game is going to be running on many different instances on across different servers, right? So it's the same game, um, but just uh, you know, in different isolated instances. And what this allows you to do as a developer or as an, econ as an economist is tweak 
the rules, tweak the conditions in one of those instances um, by changing the rules, by multiplying the resources, changing in-game prices, something like that, and holding all the other ones constant to see what happens and to see what effect those changes have. So virtual worlds give economists a great opportunity um, to, uh, to take advantage of uh, sort of inbuilt treatment and control groups uh, in a natural experiment. So if you want to look at how people react to things like price changes or sudden scarcities and so on, it gives you a kind of a cool way um, in order to, uh, to be able to do that, um, and often one that has substantially fewer costs than doing these experiments um, in the real world. Um, however, that does raise the, the sort of danger of this, which you do see in, uh, uh, in, in a lot of economic writings on this, which is, trying, it's a bit like what Hayek called the pretense of knowledge, is trying to, thinking that because you can design a virtual world um, in which you can you know, treat like a sandbox and you know, arrange according, you know, however you like, uh, that you can therefore do that in the real world as a policymaker. Uh, and that's a very sort of dangerous way of thinking about things. Um, because for example, you do see economists say things like, well, you know, like we constructed this virtual world and we let some people play around in it and we, you know, whatever. We, we came up with uh, this version of rent control in the virtual world that didn't cause housing shortages. Therefore, if we get it right in the real world, if we just tweak it just right, uh, everything's gonna be fine. Right? Um, but, uh, but this, of course, is not what happens. Um, and so there are some downsides to this. You know, there are some dangers. And it's just a good example of how you need to approach this kind of, uh, kind of research uh, with a bit of humility um, and not try and, uh, uh, not try and get too much out of it. Or just it's just important to understand its limitations. OK. So I want to talk uh, about a couple of uh, specific examples now. Um, the first one relates to. Uh, the emergence, or the, the emergence and then the decline and collapse uh, of money in virtual worlds. Now, the first part of this um, is all about Menger's theory of money. Now, I think when Sandy Klein talked about money earlier in the week, I assume she told you about Menger's theory of the, the origin of money and how money emerges from barter. Right? So I won't repeat that, um, but just to highlight the, the crucial point that without money, you have this barter situation, you have this problem of the double coincidence of wants, and as a result, barter is unbelievably costly and difficult. It's essentially impossible to have any kind of economic, you know, any significant division of labor uh, or any kind of um, significant economic development without money in order to facilitate exchange. Right? Um, and money emerges naturally from barter as the most saleable commodity. That's the crucial point of Menger's theory, is that people begin to indirectly exchange um, because they can't directly exchange through barter, so you find this sort of intermediate good um, that you use it as a medium of exchange. Right? So that's the crucial part of, uh, of Menger's theory. However, this, uh, Menger's approach has been criticized by people like historians and anthropologists who say things like, well, we actually don't have historical records of money emerging from barter, so Therefore, the, the theory doesn't really hold water uh, because there's just no evidence to suggest that this is actually what happened historically, right? It, it basically, picks or it didn't happen kind of thing, right? Um, and although, now just to be clear, there are problems with this kind of criticism. It's open to a lot of objections on other grounds. But just to take it at sort of face value for a second, given that we can't, we can't invent, we can't create thousands-year-old historical records, right? Um, so with that in mind, wouldn't it be great if we could have, say, a sort of modern, real-time example of Menger's theory of mo the emergence of money playing out, right? Um, and as it just so happens, we do, um, in the case of the virtual world um, from Diablo II. So again, this is going back a few years. Um, but it's an early example. And it's a I think it's a really good one, because it comes from an era before game developers really were thinking too much about the complexity of virtual worlds and the economics and so on. Um, and so this is a great example of, again, a kind of spontaneous emergence of money. Um, and it's a, it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice example of Menger's theory at work. So in Diablo II, um, there was a kind of an in-game money that players were supposed to use. But long story short, it was basically useless. right? So 
players in Diablo 2 were stuck in bartering with each other, right? And like a lot of RPGs, uh, Diablo 2, you, you constantly, as a player, you're constantly uh, acquiring all of these, these goods, uh, all of this loot in the virtual world, and the vast majority of it is going to be useless to you because it doesn't fit your current skill level or it doesn't fit the class uh, that you've chosen to play as or something like that. So everybody's constantly accumulating loot that they can't use, and you can't really sell it either because, again, it's just not very useful to you um, to, uh, to generate more of this in-game money. So players want to barter with each other, right? Um, and it makes perfect sense that they would because you've got something somebody else wants and vice versa. Uh, but again, here comes the problem of the double coincidence of wants, is that it's very difficult to find people who have exactly what you need, when you need it, and so on. So what happened is that gradually, without anybody really planning this, people realized that there was an item in the game called a Stone of Jordan. And it just so happened that it met all the characteristics that Manger outlined uh, that a commodity needs to be accepted as money, right? So it was very easily divisible, it was easily transportable in the game, uh, and so on, right? So players began to accumulate these stones, not because they needed them directly for some kind of consumption, but because they wanted to use them as media of exchange. And so over time, over the course of really just a few months, uh, players began to realize this and trade more systematically with each other using these Stones of Jordan as a kind of currency. And it's interesting, actually, because if you go back and you look at the old game forums, you'll see that, um, you'll see, for instance, the way that um, players start, you know, you can see posts on the old forums where players say, hey, I just realized that even though nobody, you know, even though I can't find the loot that I need, what I can do is trade for lots of these stones instead uh, and then gradually figure it out uh, over time. And so eventually people start publishing massive price lists for hundreds and thousands of different items of loot, all in terms of Stones of Jordan, right? As a, um, so I think this is a very cool example um, of just how powerful, in a way, Menger's theory still is today, and just how um, consistently you see it um, in, uh, in virtual worlds and you know, um, uh, you know, why uh, it does, in fact, I think, um, have a really strong sort of empirical foundation for it. So again, just a kind of a cool case study um, that uh, it makes a good for, a, I think, a good reply to the critics. Okay. However, uh, Blizzard, who created Diablo II, uh, did not learn the lesson from this that they probably should have, which is that it's best to let players figure these things out for themselves. Um, instead, uh, they went the opposite direction. So when they created Diablo 3, they tried to sort of force players to use the in-game currency that they decided on. Um, and they tried to make it sort of impossible, basically, for people to, to go in the direction they had with the previous game. And to tr try and you know, make a relatively you know, long story short, basically, they, they completely botched it because they didn't really consider a, how players were going to be interacting in the world. And especially, they didn't consider how they were going to manage the money supply. Um, particularly the, the inflow of, of new money into the game. So the way it works in virtual worlds, in MMOs, um, is that you have uh, what they call faucets and sinks, right? Faucets introduce new money into the in-game economy, sinks take it out, right? And so relatively, you know, on balance, you, these things should be, you know, at least somewhat equal. But Blizzard didn't really think about this. And so what ended up happening was that the faucets just kept pumping money in, um, basically, as players completed objectives and sort of new in-game money was automatically created for them as rewards. Uh, and uh, very little money was being pumped out of the economy. And as a result, uh, there was a hyperinflation, one of the first sort of digital hyperinflations in a virtual world that's taken place. The entire in game col uh, economy collapsed. Um, prices were going, you know, started at, you know, it may maybe that maybe started in the tens of thousands. Um, in the course of just a few months, they were up in like the trillions in terms of in game currency. Um, so the whole thing collapsed, um, and it's a great cautionary tale, I think, um, uh, you know, the dangers of uh, improperly managing the money supply. Um, but also, uh, 
it just goes to, because again, you might think that, well, okay, the stakes are very small, but actually they weren't because a lot of the assets in these games that are trading and that had their prices inflated you know, uh, uh, beyond all reason had very real uh, world uh, financial value. They were, they were, and are, you know, traded for for real world currency. And so, as a result of this hyperinflation, uh, a lot of people lost a lot of money, um, just uh, based on the the outrageous uh, growth uh, growth in prices. Right. Um, so, this one I'll go over relatively quickly. Um, this is about governance in virtual worlds and how you enforce the rules, right? Because Within the context of a virtual world, it's basically impossible to govern everybody's behavior from the top down. It's always possible for people to engage in kind of antisocial behavior with each other. And so in the early MMOs, again, um, in uh, EVE Online and EverQuest and World of Warcraft and things like that, people struggled for a while to try and figure out exactly how you um, encourage uh, team play. How do you encourage people um, to, uh, uh, to, to govern their own behavior? How do you incentivize them to be team players and you know, to really sort of take up the slack and, and do the heavy lifting um, as part of a team or as, as part of a guild or something like that? Um, The idea being, of course, that in virtual worlds, everybody's essentially anonymous, and you can't directly control what other people do. So you have to figure out a way to get people to behave sort of socially, right, and uh, and to not exploit the group too much for their own, you know, uh, for their own ambitions. And what this basically comes down to is a kind of a property rights problem, right? So in games like World of Warcraft, you know, you have groups, you're going out on raids, you're defeating big bosses and trying to earn, you know, loot and other valuable rewards from that. But a big problem comes up with, you know, if if you have a group of, you know, a guild of 20, 25 people and the boss that you're defeating only drops two pieces of rare loot and you don't even need some of them because they don't fit with whatever your character or your class or something. How on earth do you sort of, you know, how do you divide things? How do you establish property rights over digital items? And how do, again, how do you incentivize people to play nicely with the others in the group and actually pick up the slack and do what they're supposed to be doing? And uh, in EverQuest and in WoW and in some of these other ones, they came up with a clever system that's now been expanded in different ways to many other games, uh, the DKP system, the Dragon Kill Points, which is basically a way of uh, establishing property rights um, and encouraging everybody um, to play nicely with each other in the group and not to free ride. And the idea is that um, you, you basically, you have a sort of accountant um, who works for your group or your guild who assigns points to everybody every time you complete Goals, you know, you go out on a raid with your party and, or whatever, and uh, and everybody gets a certain number of points for being involved. Those points then become a kind of currency that you can save up and use to bid on scarce loot when it drops. Right. So the idea is that you kind of establish a sort of an artificial market within the game by using these points to allow people to bid um, and to allow sort of supply and demand for scarce loot to drop. Um, and in a way, what you're doing is establishing a kind of, as I say, a kind of a market and a kind of a system of property rights uh, without having a developer or anybody from the top down needing to do this for you. Right? I, there's a lot more to say about that one, but I'm running out of time. So um, I do want to talk just very quickly about some of the problems with the video game industry overall. Uh, as you can imagine, the quality of analysis of these kinds of issues in you know, conventional media outlets uh, is not of the, the highest quality um, and certainly could use, with, uh, with some, use some Austrian insights to it. Um, so again, I mentioned way at the beginning that the video game industry is paradoxical. It's huge, it's enormous, it's way bigger now in terms of annual global revenue than say uh, the movie industry is, for example. At the same time, it's, it's at the center of one controversy after another. And most of these are economic controversies. So I just wanna mention some of these very quickly. Uh, in the last couple of years, for example, um, thousands of jobs have been lost in the industry. This has always been a problem, but it particularly recently it's been an, a, re a really big issue. And we're not talking like small independent developers who are closing, we're talking about some of the biggest brands, um, some of the biggest regional studios in the world uh, being shut down you know, virtually overnight without warning. Um, so it's creating a lot of sort of problems uh, in the industry. However, 
what it really reflects is the, the deep uncertainty that surrounds the video game industry. Uh, as I said in my entrepreneurship lecture, all business activity really is uncertain, uh, but it's a particular problem in video games because of the way that the industry is structured. It's very difficult to uh, acquire finance um, as a developer, um, you have a lot of complex relationships between publishers, who are usually the ones who are doing the financing, and developers, who are the ones who are actually creating the games. And just in general, the costs of producing AAA level games have really ballooned over the past few decades, uh, to the point now where development cycles take three, four, five years, maybe longer. You look at what happened with Cyberpunk 2077, that game was in development for like 10 years, and it was still a disaster when it came out. Um, you know, it was just like in a really unfinished state. So you're talking years, sometimes even a decade of development time, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars being poured into development, uh, all for a very, very uncertain outcome. Because you don't know at the end, at the end of all that time and money, you don't know if consumers are actually going to buy your game. So uncertainty is a huge problem, and it's reflected um, in these constant studio closures. Um, likewise, as a result of this, as a result of the uncertainty around employment, there's a big movement for unionization uh, in different aspects of the video game industry. For instance, recently the, the quality assurance testers at Activision formed their own little small union. Um, and from an Austrian perspective, this is probably not the best idea. It's not the best way to solve the problem that you have um, for a number of different reasons. I mean, unionization has a whole host of its own problems, uh, mainly because it creates a kind of a um, uh, a kind of a, a guild where you're forcing out um, newcomers at the expense of the protected workers who are already established. Uh, but just as a practical problem of this. If people are, if employees in the game industry are really worried about keeping their jobs, unionization is not going to be the way to go because all it does is incentivize replacing human laborers uh, with, for instance, things like generative AI. Because if you have a union that demands and, and you know legal you get a, gets sort of legal enforcement of higher wages or legal enforcement of bargaining power and so on you make it more expensive to hire employees. And the more expensive you make it, the less likely companies are going to be to do it, especially if you have a super cheap, roughly comparable uh, alternative available to you, like generative AI. So for the people who are calling for unionization, um, you're really just sort of shooting yourselves in the foot with this, because you're not getting what you want. You're going to make things worse for yourselves. Uh, and then the last thing I'll mention very, very quickly, again, relates to some of these controversial business models, microtransactions, loot boxes. Uh, I've written quite a lot about this, particularly um, the, uh, the, the loot boxes. Um, again, most of this is due to just the increasing costs of making video games. Some of that is natural. Some of that comes from the market and just from you know, the scale that's involved and the time that's involved. At the same time, a lot of it is caused by regulation as well, particularly things like intellectual property laws, licensing regulations, and so on. This massively drives up the cost of, of creating games because whether it's art assets or game engines or what have you, these things are extremely expensive to license from the people who own them. So um, the more that these laws and these regulations, uh, you know, the longer we go, um, the more sort of burdensome they become in terms of increasing the cost of game development, and the more they kind of push publishers and developers into developing these other kinds of controversial business models, like trying to get people to make microtransactions and things like that. So again, if your goal is to sort of get rid of those things, um, you should probably look closer at the regulations that are making them more and more uh, likely to happen. So I'm out of time. Um, thank you very much. Uh.